east of Cleveland, Ohio, and Chesterland, up there on the north coast. All right, this, of course, is a big topic. We were just having a discussion here about one aspect of it. it could probably be a chapter in a book or an entire book, um, but we have 45 minutes here. I, as I always do, my slides have been tweaked since they're published in your book. We have to get those into Tim at the end of March. And of course, here we are in the middle of May. And anybody who thinks you're not going to change something between then and now is just crazy. And usually I add 30 slides is the way this normally goes. OK, we're going to be talking about HF Yaggies in the 40 to 10 meter frequency range, horizontal polarization stacked vertically, right? That thing. Um, VHF, UHF Yaggies change the playing field a little bit because of their very long, long boom lengths relative to wavelength and the height above ground. Propagation modes are a bit different, so we're not doing that. It's its own big, rich topic. All right, some background material first, and hopefully I can go pretty quick because I have a lot of slides. Um, you know, when I was a young ham, which is now coming up, coming up on 50 years for me, I heard this nugget of wisdom about antennas, which was get as much metal as you can, as high in the air as you can. And I must confess, I screw a lot with antennas, and that still seems to have a lot of truth to it, right? It's not like that's a completely misguided statement. So when I first heard about the idea of stacking Yaggies, I thought, oh, I get this. More antennas equals more metal, higher up in the air, we have more gain, that's it. You know, that's pretty much the beginning and end of it. And of course, adding antennas should add gain, but it's probably most important to make sure we don't end up with deep nulls in the elevation pattern that end up negating all of our hard work in building the stack. So no matter how much maximum gain you have at some takeoff angle, a 20 plus dB null wipes it all away at another angle. And this topic of avoid avoiding vertical nulls is sort of the constant theme through my whole presentation here. And at some point in this, I was thinking the phrase, beware the lurking null. Evaluating the design of a stack should always include a consideration of the elevation angles and make sure they don't swallow up um, energy at desirable ones. Sort of another analogy is an open manhole cover. You then lead to a related question, can my Yagi antenna ever be too high? Which of course from my old early ham days maxim, well you can never be too high, but it does turn out that you actually can be too high. And we'll get into that here. Okay, and of course, other factors beyond these nulls matter, like gain. And of course, we all should know that a low SWR is not a proof of overall antenna performance, but it is a factor to be considered. The example I like is a dummy load has a low and flat SWR, but you're not going to make a lot of contacts with it. So to me, SWR is not everything, but it is something. And of course, often in contesting with uh, guest operators, having a low and flat SWR reduces the need for endless amp tweaking um, in the heat of the battle. OK, a single Yagi is not a stack, but we can learn a lot by looking at it for a little bit here. From the book Yagi Antenna Design by Jim Lawson, W2PV, it's, um, I think, out of print, sadly, used to be available from the ARRL, but it's a great book. It even predates heavy modeling and that, but it's still a wonderful book to have on your bookshelf. But he writes here, page 5-7, thus we see that the main lobe of an antenna occurs at an angle primarily determined by its height above ground, but secondarily by the natural antenna directivity. So maximum gain occurs in the main pattern lobe, and nulls occur above and below it. In fact, they define it, right? So every time we talk about, boy, do I have a lot of gain, someplace nearby, by definition, you've got a lot of null, right? It's the null that focuses it. So talking about the gain's fine. Don't forget the null. Um, and of course, so the maximum forward gain of a Yagi occurs at a particular takeoff angle that is never too far from a null takeoff angle. And in fact, they get closer together as the height increases, so you almost have to pay more attention. And it turns out that a, even a single Yagi has properties like a stack because it's interacting with its image antenna created by the effect of real ground, right? Our waves bounce off the ground, and in effect, you end up with what amounts to a stack. OK, so let's verify Lawson's lobe height claim with some simple models. I went through the ARRL antenna book, 23rd edition, grabbed a 15-meter Yagi, three elements on a 12-foot boom. 21.1 megahertz, EasyNet Pro 4, version 6, 
real average ground, you know, typical conditions, nothing here fancy or tricky. The goal here is to step through the elevation patterns as a function of height in one quarter wavelength step starting at a quarter wavelength, okay? One quarter wavelength at 21.1 megahertz is 11.66 feet, so let's round that up to 12 to make thinking about this easier. So what we're gonna do here is look at going from effectively 12 feet to 192 feet in 12 foot increments, okay? And there's a few feet of rounding error by the time you get to the top. Um, but you know, that's okay for this purposes. In case my fancy GIF animation on the next slide doesn't work, but I know it does, just here to look at a couple select patterns. At a half wavelength above ground, we've got largely one big fat salted peanut lobe, right? Um, and you think, boy, that looks almost cleaner than the rest of this nonsense, but it's 11.83 dBi of gain at a 25 degree takeoff angle, which as we'll see is pretty darn high. And in fact, there is no null angle because, well, it's just one lobe. If we go up to one wavelength, our gain's increased almost a dB, which is nice. And our main lobe is tipped down to 13 degrees from 25. That sounds good. But we've developed a second lobe. And in fact, at 29 degrees is the null between them. If we continue to go up to two wavelengths, about 96 feet for this example, our gain has moved up a little more, but not as much as the first step, 13.18 dBi, but the main lobe has continued to tip down to seven degrees. Now the null's at 14. And of course, what's interesting is that over here where there's a null at 14 degrees is where pretty much all the energy was for half the height. And then finally, if we go to four wavelengths, that 192 feet, 13.17 dBi, which is really not much of an increase at all, but we have dropped down to three degrees with a null at seven degrees. And so what we're talking about you know, constantly in this whole presentation is here's this null, right? And we wanna make sure that energy from stations we care to talk to doesn't show up there because we're not gonna hear them as well. And certainly in a contest, right? You know, a couple dBs matter a lot in a contest, so it's not just like casual um, rag chewing. All right, here's my little animation that does work. And so when we start off at a quarter wavelength here, that's the big fat blob. There it is. And of course, what we basically see is that as you continue to go up, the main lobe drops, 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 drops. You pick up all these other lobes. Um, there actually turns out to be a formula for that, that the number of peaks is equal to twice the height and wavelength. Odd one quarter wavelength heights have this overhead peak. Notice how there's sort of an overhead peak that comes and goes here as we switch between even in odd quarter wavelengths. Um, so there's more discussion about this in the May-June 2017 QEX on page 28. And this is Kai Siwak. Um, he apparently is the editor of QEX2, KE4PT. There will be some impact, and we're gonna get to that, but that's a good question. So especially when you see something like this and you say, oh, easy neck and antenna model. That means a flat, I'm gonna say perfect ground. I don't mean that because you can make it have resistance and characteristics, but in, a, in terms of bouncing signals, it's flat. And of course, the real world isn't flat. So it's a good point, but we'll get to that. Okay, so if we graph that same information, we find this. Here's our gain, and as we go from the quarter wavelength up here till about one wavelength, one and a quarter, we do pick up about three dB of gain. Here's the gain axis, and that's kind of cool. But then once we get up to around one and a quarter dB, now that's it, that we don't get any more gain out of it, right? So one angle is to say, well, I'm done with that. If all you cared about is gain, that's an attitude, but you're missing the point. The takeoff angle here in yellow always continues to go down. So it started off very high. Here we saw a half wavelength around 25-ish and it continues to drop, and we get down here to that three degrees at four wavelengths above ground. But the blue line here is the null, right? The null right above it. And that, of course, starts off quite high, but then moves down as well as the, uh, the main lobe, right? And notice that it really is getting closer and closer the higher we get. So to some sense, the higher the Yagi, the more it needs to be part of a stack so that you're not having a great signal here and a bad one there. I guess another way to say it is that extreme height is all about getting access to extremely low angles. 
Okay, those are results for three-element Yagi. If we increase the boom length, it'll make it even more directive in the vertical plane. Um, this, of course, was a single Yagi, but stacks have similar nulls, although, of course, it's all a function of the, the heights in that. Um, but the bottom line is you can't have a, a main lobe without a null very close by. And we want to keep track of the maximum gain angles as well as the minimum gain, the null angles, because operating in a null is a real buzz kill. Okay, just to look at this a little bit more, the way to think about what's going on is this is our Yagi, we have a direct ray, but then there's also the reflected ray off the ground, which actually can be thought about as if there were an image antenna down here, the same height, but below ground, with 180 degrees phase shift, and that's why this really is sort of a two stack, even with one Yagi, due to the ground. Um, and of course, if we didn't have the ground, this is what the elevation pattern of the Yagi would look like, rather boring, right? Um, now, another effect of ground, which is good, is that because we've put it down here, this free space um, pattern has a gain of 7.47 dBi, whereas the same antenna over ground is about 13 dBi. So there's a 6 dB difference, I think we've all heard that, from the effect of ground. Here's another picture of that phenomenon from a recent ARRL book. Um, antenna physics, it's just been out a couple of months and I picked up a copy. It's got some good information in it, um, but this is an EM pro simulation of the waves, but we see the same thing obviously, reinforcement and nulls. Okay, so it's pretty clear we need to understand the elevation angles of signals we care about, because there can be nulls. So what are the elevation angles? I know of two ways to generate that information. The old-fashioned way is to consult tables in the ARRL antenna book and probably other places. Um, that data is in the antenna book up to and including the 18th edition, 1997, so 20 years ago. The newer way is to use a program called HFTA, the HF Terrain Assessment Program. And this takes into account the actual site topography. So that was the question you had back there. Um, which is, of course, very important, can be important. And that approach is in the 19th and later editions of the ARRL antenna book. And elevation angles, of course, are a function of many factors, the band, the point and sunspot cycle, the radio locations on the planet, the number of skips, the height of the layers causing the skipping. So, of course, the bottom line is at different times, the same path may occur at different angles. And to me, at the end of the day, that's sort of part of the fun, right? If we didn't have propagation, what would be the point, almost, of a lot of this, certainly at HF? Okay, here's sort of the old-fashioned paperweight from the 18th edition antenna book. Here's W8, close to where we are, Cincinnati, to the world. And for Europe, for 20 meters, they gave us this information. The claim here, and, and this is based upon running a program called IONCAP many times and doing statistical analysis, is that 100% of the contacts from W8 into something called Europe um, occur at a takeoff angle of 1 to 28 degrees, 100%. Now, if you're willing to back off to 90%, which a casual operator might, but a contester might have a different opinion, um, 3 to 12 degrees is the coverage you need. And then they give us a peak angle, eight degrees, that occurs 26% of the time. And the next one is three degrees, that's 6% of the time. This, so this is one way that the information was presented. And there was a number of tables, and you could pick your source and destination and band. Um, later antenna books moved into this format. It's same information, but presented slightly differently. So here we have the elevation takeoff angle. This is Boston to all of Europe. Here's 20 meters again. Now we have to sort of look at it and find the clusters ourselves. But we can see here's some 11 and a 12 and a 9 and a 10 and an 8, and we sort of get the same information out of it. OK, HFTA, the HF Terrain Assessment Program by Dean Straw, N6BV. It's a Windows PC program. And it's part of the recent edition antenna books on the CD in the back. Now, it not only features more geographic locations, but includes elevation pattern information computed for a general stack description that's not as complex as a full-blown model. Um, I don't know how many people here do modeling, but modeling can be work, right? Oftentimes, you start off by saying, hey, who's got a model for this? And you're searching on the internet. It's amazing how many times you don't find models. Um, writing your own model is not that bad. I spend a lot of my time doing that, but you know, it is work. HFTA doesn't have any of that. It has a much simpler um, model interface. To me, that makes it great for what-if analysis and project planning. 
and HFTA can handle a stack of one to four Yagis with one to eight elements. Okay, so here's an example. We have this 21 megahertz three element Yagi at 96 feet or two wavelength, what I've been talking about. In the previous example, we're saying the ground is flat, the terrain is um, flat, and we run it and we get this. And of course, this is here's the takeoff angle and here's the gain out of it. And of course, when you stop and think about this, well, again, this is a perfect world because we had a flat ground profile. But when you think about this, these two should be the same, right? Our pattern we get out of a modeling program and this had better be the same or somebody's screwing with us. And it turns out they are very darn close. We do find a main lobe here about seven degrees and it's around 13 dBi, which is what we had before. We have a null here at 14, that matches. Here's the second lobe at um, about 21, 22 degrees. So it's two different ways of saying the same thing, right? Don't think they're different pieces of information. It's all the same thing. Now the next thing we can do is add in elevation data representing two points on the globe. So here I'm gonna pick W8 Ohio in Europe again. Everything else has stayed the same. And it turns out there's over a thousand of these .prn files on the 23rd edition. So the granularity of data is much better than it uh, has been in the past. Much more data. So now on this graph, we sort of have the two things we cared about all at once. We have our antenna response, here's gain on the left with the lobes, but now we have our histogram with percentages here on the right axis for the takeoff angles and the signals, right? And of course that now lets us bring together pretty much everything we need to ask the question, is this thing any good? Um, here, if we were trying to be critical, we might say, well, gee, here's our maximum gain uh, at about 13 dBi, but if we look at the statistical, you know, where the signals are, there's kind of a little trough there. Um, maybe that could be a little bit better. Maybe we wished our lang angle was a little bit lower. And like here where there's a null, we notice there's a couple of angles nearby that have a few percent, maybe you added up to that 10% number or so. But in any case, that's the point of this sort of graph is to let you analyze um, what your antenna stack does versus where the signals are. But wait, there's even more. We can actually, now this gets back to your point. We can actually bring in the actual, the terrain data for the location of our antenna tower. And of course, local terrain can have a substantial impact on the actual pattern of the real antenna. This explains why similar installations in the same general area can have very different performance. To use that phrase, what is the economy stupid? It's the location stupid. And antenna models assume a flat and perfect region around the antenna. Now generating that data, I think used to be a royal pain in the butt. Okay, I don't know how many people have done it, but you had to go off to these USGS survey sites and download stuff and plats and regions and all kinds of stuff and it was very painful. A website's out there, oops, k6tu.net, who has an online calculator that you give it co coordinates and it automatically generates the data files for all 360 degrees at once. Um, it's a pretty nice site, that's what I used for this presentation. The site does want you to sort of sign up and be a member and then there's a paying service, I think, for propagation data. You don't have to do that to get to this data. And I did look and see that K6TU is participating in some forum and the Hamvention over the weekend. So if you want to track this guy down, he, will, he is around here somewhere. Okay, so here's terrain data from my location in lovely old Chesterland, Ohio. And I picked two directions, 45 degrees sort of towards Europe and 270 straight west. And here's the result. So if we take the red one, which is here, this, and a, by the way, my Yagi here is a 60, a, kind of typical tri-bander on a 60-foot tower. Um, of course, that doesn't impact the terrain profile, but that's what it is. So if we look at the 45-degree azimuth here in red, it turns out if you stand at my antenna tower and start walking at 45 degrees, it actually starts to go uphill and there's a little rise here. I know this one quite well from being on my bicycle. And then it continues to go up about 100 feet when we get about a mile away and has that shape. Now to the west, that's a little bit more interesting. Um, the sharp drop to the west is, some, is the river valley for the Chagrin River, which is a little river outside of Cleveland. And there we sort of slowly, slightly slope downward here, and then we get about a mile and a half away. Here's the actual river valley. I'm hoping that the river flows here. Um, 
And of course, we asked the question, well, what impact do these terrains have on my performance? So now in this graph, we can put it all together. The green response, which is a little bit hard to see, is perfect, right? That's the model for flat. That's ideal. Nobody has that, but it's a nice reference. Red is towards Europe, and of course, if we start off here at the low angles, well, there's this little thing that suggests for a very low angle, red may have a little improvement, but otherwise, it kind of tracks just the flat terrain. Then we get up here to some probably useful angles, five, six, seven, eight, nine degrees, and my antenna is at a disadvantage of perhaps two to three dB over if I had a flat terrain. If we go to 270 degrees, heading straight west, um, there's a different story, and now it turns out that at very low angles, I actually have a fairly substantial increase in gain. And then, of course, at some point, it all comes together. And I've sort of, over the years, that's the way operating has rung true to me, right? If somebody says, ooh, the DX is over you know, in the Atlantic or up there and uh, either further north, it's like, OK, I'm just going to begin with everybody else, right, struggling. But if it's to the west and some islands out there, boy, my antenna seems to work a lot better. And there's reasons for that. OK, here's just another example. Back in the day, about 1960, um, Frank Lewis, W3CRA, Silent Key, was known to have one of the consistently louder signals on 20 into Asia. And he had a modest three-element Yagi on a 70-foot tower. Well, the magic turned out to be his location on the side of a hill over a valley sloping towards Asia. And people got his location and ran it through HFTA. And it shows down here at these lower angles that really matter by the histogram bars here that he had about a 12 to 15 dB gain advantage because of the terrain around him that obviously made up for a three element Yagi on a 70 foot tower. And if you said, well, boy, wouldn't it be great if he was at the top of the hill? That's got to be better, right, Greg? Well, not necessarily. If you believe this, for the very low angles, the blue, which is where he was, is actually have a little bit more gain than green, which was the top of the hill. And we do get to a point, though, where green does matter for certain takeoff angles. This material I ripped off from Bill Tippett's uh, W4ZV website. So this can have a big impact, and it's you know, worth doing and for helping evaluating stacks. OK, both antenna models and HFTA are powerful tools for evaluating the performance of a stack. HFTA allows you to configure stack models in a matter of seconds with elevation patterns as good as a detailed antenna model. And of course, that's possible because what really matters is the height off ground, right? Not little details about the taper of your elements. That's not really having a big impact on things like takeoff angles. Models are good, and if you want to do things like look at SWR or bandwidth, you probably need models, but you know, you've got to then get into that. And for me, whenever I'm involved in a stack project, um, I use both tools, and of course, my goal again is to make sure I'm not, I don't have a null someplace I wasn't paying attention to where usually it's fairly low and you think there's important signals there. Okay, single Yagi over ground, we're still talking about that. There's sort of this raging debate, and I guess I just wanted to touch it here for a second. So if you have just a tri-band around a single tower, which is a lot of hams, is there a best height, okay? Well, obviously, given what we're talking about, there is no one really good height, um, because obviously, one wavelength on 20 meters is two wavelengths on 10 meters, right? So you're, you're kind of picking your poison here. Um, I think a lot of sources end up talking about as a compromise for 10 to 20 meters, 60 to 80 feet, about one wavelength on 20, two on 10 again. Um, but the suggestion here is based upon avoiding nulls, not maximizing gain, right? So if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you know, buddy, if you raised your antenna, you would have more gain at a lower angle. Yes, of course that's true. But you would have some nulls creeping in there too. Depending upon your mode of operation, you know, is the DX more domestic? That might really, you know, be a problem. And, of course, you know, at the end of the day, there's no free lunch, and you can't end up with a Yagi that's too high. Okay, stack spacing. I'm calling two or more Yagis in the same tower, um, having at least one operating mode where they're combined together, a stack. But many times there are situations where you have multiple same band Yagis on a tower that are really independent, right? And I'm not calling that a stack. And usually it's because their combination does not result in a useful antenna pattern. There might be other reasons. For example, you want to have a fixed antenna on the Caribbean. 
So the notion of it's going to participate in the stack isn't all that useful because you know, we're only pointing in that direction part of the time. And you want to be able to go and switch to it quickly. Um, here's a quick example. Consider a five element 10 meter Yagi at 30 feet and one at 200 feet. Okay, over flat ground, HFTA predicts the following. And now, of course, it turns out that blue is this combination 30 and 200 feet. Green is just the 200 and red is the 30 foot. So we're really asking the question as we move through these angles, what's the highest signal, right? That's how our eyes are following this. Well, it looks like green wins up through here, although blue's close, but green does win. Then we drop into a null for both green and blue, but ah, the 30-foot Yagi here for a couple of degrees is the best choice. And then we go back to the single Yagi at 200, then the single Yagi at 30 wins, and finally we get up here to 12 degrees, which for 10 meters is getting to be a pretty high angle. And now finally, the stack combined together on these highlighted regions has the most gain, although it's only about two to three dB, well, three to four dB, so it's not like a null. But um, there's value in each antenna, but not much in their combination. I guess that's the point I'm getting at. Okay, stacks help us avoid nulls and important takeoff angles by providing a set of selectable Yagi combinations. If somebody says they have a stack, but there's not a box to pick combinations, then they're really thinking there's only one thing they care about, right? There always should be that switch somewhere picking combinations to get the real benefit out of the stack. The stack doesn't eliminate nulls, of course. They're a necessary part of having a focused main lobe, but they let you basically change the angle so with a particular setting, you have a pattern and not a null. Let's see here, and of course, oftentimes, I'm sure we all have the experience, you're in the contest and you're going back and forth with the knob, bum, 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 trying to find the strongest signal. Um, it's also not uncommon to prefer lower angle choices at the beginning and end of an opening and higher angles in the middle. Okay, in choosing the distance between Yagis, there are two important considerations. Of course, beyond the most important, which is what space do you have on your tower, which of course always is the big factor here but the impact on the gain in the pattern and the impact on the feed point impedance. Of all the practical feed point impedances, uh, feed systems I should say I'm aware of, and, and boxes to deal with stacking, they all take the assumption that a Yagi is like a 50 ohm dummy load, okay? And for that result, for that reason, going with like an OWA Yagi is oftentimes attractive for stacking, so you hopefully can get that flat 50 ohm or close to it response. Because of that, if you take like two Yagis and combine them in parallel, literally with the T-junction, you end up with 25 ohms, right? It's simple ohms law stuff. Three Yagis would be what, 16.67 ohms. Um, if the antennas, usually because they're too close, have significant coupling between them, that could throw off the feed point impedances, which isn't fatal, but now you basically have to go through work to figure out a feed system that combines them. And you know, that's sort of a custom job, if you will. Okay, typical HF spacing in many sources is quoted as like a half to one wavelength. The ARRL antenna book highlights 0 0.6 to 0.75. Of course, larger spacing reduces coupling between the Yaggies. The UVHF, UHF people, of course, have their own rule of thumb. And in theory, adding a second identical Yaggie should increase the gain by three dB. That's sort of a number people keep in their head, but that should be viewed as an upper bound the gain's usually a bit less. And of course, if you go from two to four Yaggies, that should then add three more dB or about six dB total. Okay, so let's investigate stack spacing with a model of two 10 meter six element OWA Yaggies on a 26 foot boom. One will be fixed at one wavelength and the other will move up in steps of a 10th wavelength, which is three and a half feet, from one and a half to 2.2 wavelengths. Yes, yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So in that case, it doesn't really matter what the coaxial feed length is through the stack to the because the feed lines from the top and bottom create a phase shift. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, boy, I hope not. Yeah, that is an issue. Um, I think the simplest thing to say is that the feed lines are usually assumed to be all the same length. Now, oh yeah, for sure I think they need to be the same length. Yeah, that's right. However, then there's sometimes sort of another subpart of the religion that suggests they should be odd multiples of quarter wavelengths. Yeah, and that, I, but that's coming up here, but it's, but it's a good point. And that goes to this point, right, which is at the end of the day, of course, we know what matters is current, not power, right? There's so much of ham antenna lore, especially with vertical arrays, that is just so wrong. Because it starts off with something like, I've got a two element, 40 meter vertical phased array, I'm feeding it with 500 wa or 1,000 watts, that means I want 500 watts in each vertical. No. You usually want equal currents, right? Not power, and that's a lot, of, a lot of mess there. Okay, so here's what we're doing in this example. One wavelength, one Yagi is at one, one is at one and a half. We're gonna hold this one fixed, and this one we're gonna slowly move up, dun, 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 up to 2.2 wavelengths. So we can cover that region of 0.5 uh, to 1.2 wavelength spacing. And in case my fancy animations don't work, but they do, so, but here we can see at half wavelength spacing, we have, you know, this lobe. But if we look between the two of them, at some level, I'm willing to say, you know, they're kind of the same, right? Because we have one main lobe here. There's some secondary lobes. It's a little bit lower here. But, you know, for the most part, it's not like they're radically night and day different. Now, here's the animation again, and we'll see pop up here. Okay, there's 0.5 wavelength. And we're moving again through the 10th wavelength spacing. And the second, oops, secondary lobes do a little dance, because that's what secondary lobes like to do. We note that 0.5 wavelength spacing has the lowest overhead gain, but of course, oftentimes, you don't think there's much energy up there. But, um, you know, for the most part, these are all sort of working, right? OK, if we take this back into graph data then, and we, of course, our baseline is one Yagi's at 35 and one's at 77. and um, if we then start to increase the spacing, here's the spacing 0 0.5, 0 0.6 wavelength, it turns out that the gain starts off about 17 dBi, and of course here were our reference gains, right? So at the very least we have a dB and a half over just the 177 foot high Yagi. At 35 feet it's almost 2 dB, right, of gain increase. If we get it to a separation of about one wavelength, the gain actually peaks here at about two and a half dB increase over the single 35-foot Yagi as a reference. And of course, this is just an example. Uh, you've got to really look at every case, but I think, it, generally speaking, it's true. Okay, what about the feed point impedances? Because this goes into the issue of, when I start to combine them, what's gonna to happen to my SWR? So here, of course, as we, look at, as we look at the spacing, what we're trying to see, and of course, you've got to use antenna modeling for this, not HFTA, we're looking to see that the impedances sort of stay around 50 ohms plus J0, you know, no reactants, right? Our 50 ohm dummy load. And, you know, just from a casual inspection, we have 49, 48, 52, 55, you know, so it's looking pretty good. Um, so this conclusion from one example that the max gain increased up to 2.5 dBi, that should just be 2.5 dB, um, depending upon your reference, the lowest single Yagi. The max gain here occurred with a spacing of about 1 dB. The coupling was low, suggesting that we can treat them sort of like 50 ohm loads for the purposes of combining them. Um, the secondary lobes dance around like they do. So in other words, the advice from a lot of places of a half to one wavelength or so spacing is pretty darn good. Um, but again, you should really you know, trust but verify. Okay, so far we've looked at three permutations of two antennas. The bottom Yagi by itself, the top Yagi by itself, both together fed and phased. So that goes to your comment about the lines are being the same length. They're fed and phased. Fed and phased so equal That's right. That's right. There turns out to be one more useful permutation um, to consider, and that's both antennas fed with equal but out of phase currents. Okay? And that turns out to be useful because what it usually always does is cause the main lobe to tip up. And this is all about, you know, elevation angle coverage. And I think, I hope we all are familiar with the terms BIP and BOP, right? BIP is both in phase, BOP is both out of phase. And those are sort of the permutations, right? The two together in phase, two together out of phase, one or the other. I think that pretty much covers it. 
Now here's what BOP looks like on that same example. So notice that that lobe tipped up your way to what, about 20 degrees, 5, 10, 15, 20 degrees. Now the BOP gain is 16.19 dBi, and the BIP gain when they, they were in phase is 17.54. So yeah, there's about a 1.3 dB of drop, but we're not in a null, right? It's about the 20 dB null we're avoiding, issues of one or two, three dB be between friends, right? Who cares? Okay. So if we take the combinations here of the two in phase, which primary means here, out of phase, the 35 footer, the 70, and plot them all together at the same time, which you can do with like modeling software or HFTA, you end up with this sort of picture, right? And I know this kind of looks like some big ink blot over here, but to me the idea is in evaluating this to ask, as I go through the range of takeoff angles, I give a hoot about, do I see a null, right? I mean, it's kind of that simple. What else are we trying to do here? Um, so no deep nulls. Now you can do the same thing with HFTA. This is the exact same model. And we notice here from zero to 13 degrees, BIP, both in phase, blue, is our winner, if you will. Then we get to a small region here when red, which is just the single 35 footer, has the strongest signal. And then BOP turns out this light blue to then win up to the uh, high angles. So, of course, every example is different, every situation, but this, to me, is the process of evaluating this. Okay. I think that's pretty much what I've been saying. Okay, how do we actually combine or feed the Yaggies? We need a box that has 50 ohms, a, station, a 50 ohm port for the station, and several 50 ohm ports for all of the Yaggies, right? And of course, it should be possible to include a Yagi either in phase or out of phase and exclude a Yagi. And we're assuming that Yagi is 50 ohms, so therefore any parallel junction is an impedance equal to 50 divided by the number. And again, we're assuming equal currents in all the antennas. If you start to have more than two antennas, that's actually a variable you can play with. I don't think many people do, but just for the sake of being clean in my slides here, we're assuming equal currents. Okay, this is already getting to your point now. One thing that some folks like to do is have those feed lines from the box where the lines are gonna be connected together. Probably after some relays are in there, we get the relays. But from that point to the driven element, the connection on the driven element on the Yagi to have odd quarter wavelength multiples of coax. And that's so it can exploit this property called current forcing. And folks who are like, this usually seems to come up more with like vertical array design and that. But what's interesting, and I don't have time to explain current forcing, but when you think about it, in the box, we have a wide junction, right? The two come together. That's voltage forcing. Those two voltages, by God, have got to be the same. I wire them together. It turns out, due to the magic of coax and transmission lines, a quarter wavelength away and add multiples, the currents, no matter what the impedance connected to it is, the currents are all the same. That's why we force the currents. That's where the name comes from. So if there's imperfections in the sameness of Yagi's, the current forcing helps you smooth that out. If you, you know, but it's, to me, this is now getting into like, how deep is your religion, right? You go to church just on Sunday or in the other holy days too. As a Catholic, or I should say that better than just this undescript holy days. Anyway, um, Okay, if a Yagi's, yeah, and of course another point of this now is that if that same feed line, if we choose not to use the Yagi, what are we gonna do with it, right? Well, do we leave it open, do we short it, what do we do? One religion sort of says, short it at the box. Now when you go the odd quarter wavelength multiples away, it's an open circuit that helps discourage current flowing in that other Yagi. And you might also say there's a lightning thought there, right, which is that, if I'm shorting antennas sort of when the box is off and we get a nearby lightning strike, boy, that's sort of, you know, I may have to fix something, but I'm not bringing all this energy into the station. Okay, two popular approaches to impedance matching are one quarter wavelength transmission lines and um, tr uh, transmission line transformers. Using conventional transformers usually doesn't work. These power levels, here's the coax scheme and it shows, for example, if you wanted to match two antennas, you're gonna have a 25 ohm junction. Well, it turns out you can go out and buy something called RG83. It's a 0.405 inch outside diameter coax. So you can put two 
PL 259s on it and everything. And um, that's a 35 ohm coax, hard to believe but true. And that lets you take 25 ohms and transform it into 49 ohms. Is that exactly 50? No, but it's considered close enough. Likewise, if you had three antennas with the junction impedance of 16.67, if you combine in parallel a quarter wavelength of 213 in RG11, that's a net impedance of 30, and the transformation through the quarter wavelength, you end up with 54 ohms, which is a 1.08 SWR if everything's perfect. Again, most people say, you know, good enough. Um, now, of course, the downside to this approach is this is obviously a single band solution, right? We've cut these lines for one band. So if you're running mono banders, this is the way to go. Um, yeah, let me just, in the interest of time, this is a subtlety about adding and removing lines here. Transmission line transformers, of course, were championed by a ham by the name of Jerry Sevick. He's sadly a silent key now. Um, on one hand, they're more broadband than quarter wavelength lines, but they seem to be, and I was trying to think of the right ways to say this, not as precise as quarter wavelength lines. And part of the reason is it's hard to get exactly the desired ratios. So for example, two to one turns out to be a pretty much impossible ratio to get. You can get 2.25 to one, but of course that just means you're gonna have a bigger SWR discontinuity. But if your goal is to stack um, multiple band antennas like tri-banders, you don't really have a choice because quarter wavelength of coax will change for every band. There's a lot of commercial uh, choices here. Here's a picture of an array solution stack match that uses the Cevix transmission line transformer. Um, so here, if we're talking about let's stack a stack of two, um, our possible choices, we said top, bottom, bip, or bop. Outline of a design, use quarter wavelength lines between the box and the feed points to exploit current forcing, short unused lines at the box to discourage current flow and unused Diaggies. If you need to invert the phase for the out of phase part, use a 180 degree transmission line if you're monoband, or you could do an RF choke and using it as a, a ballon. More about that in a little bit. Um, yeah, boy, we're running out of time, so that's why I'm sort of skipping some things here. Of course, what if you're stacking more than two antennas? And now we sort of get more into religion again and philosophy of stacking. Here's two approaches that I've certainly seen. What I'm calling subsets. So if our three Yaggies are one, two, and three gang, right? That's where we're gonna, the numbers, the single digits are the Yaggies. If we're talking about, let me just pick a couple of the Yaggies at once. We have this subset. We could do all three, one, two, three. We could do the top two. We could do the bottom two. We could do the upper and the bottom, leaving the middle. We could do the single Yaggies, right? Seven combinations of Yaggies. Now it turns out that oftentimes that 13 combination is not that useful because we skipped the Yaggy in the middle and that gets to a very wide spacing that just isn't, doesn't result in a good pattern. Now the other approach though for out of phase we could say we have all one, two, three again just like this and of course for the most part this is considered the big thing, right? All the Yaggies together, usually what folks are really after. You just wanna make sure you don't give something up to get that. Um, but you could put one out of phase with two and three, or two out of phase with one and three, and et cetera, four combinations. In modeling this and working with this at a few places, I find they basically end up with similar results. So it's really a matter of personal style. Of course, one aspect here is that out of phase operation implies all your antennas are in the same direction, right? If you have a rotating tower, that means they always will be in the same direction. And if you're using all the antennas and selectively putting some out of phase, great, but if you're a little bit fancier and you've got like ring rotators and you want to sometimes maybe put a couple antennas towards the Caribbean and some towards Europe, if you're requiring all the antennas to be used together, you can't do that, right? Um, so those factors enter into it as well. This was an example here. Boy, I guess we're pretty much out of time here. I was going to do the K3LR one where Tim has got on his run stacks are four OWA Yaggies, and basically he has 10 combinations available by a push button switch, and I see the guy in the back who I think is responsible for the switch, um, that picks all four, of the singles, or top three, bottom three, and of course, I guess the thing we can get to here is if you plot all of those combinations, you get this sort of mess, okay? But what you end up doing is defining sort of what the 
performances, and again, the point is, are there any nulls at angles you care about? So we are slowly losing gain as you go in higher takeoff angles, but you know, no nulls. Okay, gang, I guess we're pretty much at 11, right? Pardon me? But I can really go to 11.15? You sure? All right, well, then we'll keep going. Jeez. Ah. Okay. But Tim's going to come in here and yell at me, and I'm going to point at all of you and say, talk to them. They're my boss. <laughs> all right, gang, we'll keep going then, because I do have more stuff, and I always do this. I have way too many slides. Okay, but of course, in this case, like in Tim's case, he can split the Yaggies out because they're on ring rotators, and then being able to select Yaggies becomes a way of giving you two stacks on the same tower, right? By switching combinations, you're also switching directions, which can, you know, speed matters, of course, in contesting. If you go to his same station and do the out-of-phase approach instead of the subset, you end up with this, and the black line here is kind of what Tim currently has. And in fact, when you look at this, if you cared about these higher angles, and they are getting to be sort of nosebleed angles, you actually would have more gain. But there's also a little zone in here where there's kind of a null. Oops. So um, again, a lot of this is a matter of personal preference. Commercial stacking boxes. There's, of course, a bunch. Array Solutions has several. DX Engineering has several. I just sort of looked generally on the internet so I wasn't being biased towards any one brand. I found something from RF Ham Design, the Spid Stacker. You can roll your own. I've done a lot of this. Um, in fact, I see Tim's not in the room. It hit me a few years ago that like 90% of the contacts out of K3LR go through connections I've soldered. And I thought, boy, do I really want that responsibility? Um, but you can roll your own boxes, and it's not too hard, and you could probably save a lot of money. Um, here's a couple of them. Relays. If you've ever opened up your antenna switches or boxes, I've I hope you've seen that in the last 20 years, folks have gone to these appliance relays for relays in this application. For HF, good stuff, 1,500 watts, 2,000 watts, no problem. They're pretty inexpensive, um, and that's what most people use. For connectors, there's a number of things you can do. We've actually been using some trailer connectors here. They're easy to water, waterproof and weatherproof and give you like four or five conductors, but they're for car trailers. There are these sort of here, the Euro style or greeny connectors. And of course, if you're going to be high up in the air, get ones that screw down. Um, that's one thing you can do. The 180 degree phase inversion we talked about. Um, of course, what you'd really like is a phase shift without any loss. Well, good luck with that, right? Loss always goes along with most everything we do. Um, you can use a half wavelength of coax if you're going monoband. Um, another approach here is, and that's broadband, is to use a ballon or an RF choke or what some people want to call the Guinella one-to-one -one phase inversion. And that's, of course, when you wind a few feet of coax, usually like thin RG142 stuff, um, around a ferrite core. And at the other side, you can actually flip ground in the signal, right? You've been cut loose from the ground reference. That's what balance, or balance means, right? Balanced and unbalanced. You lose the ground reference. And that's you put in the 180 degree phase shift. Here's a board I built as an experiment a few years ago that has four, so this is a stack of four high, and it turns out that this uses both the phase inverting uh, balance in here, as well as selecting switch, uh, combinations on the stack. And there were like 22 combinations. Well, of course, that's way too many for practical use, right? Nobody wants to be going through a rotary switch of 22 choices saying, hey, where's he loudest, right? But in terms of experimental things, you can do that. OK, odds and ends here. Some folks have done things like investigate being able to selectively turn off the top Yagi in a stack on reception to reduce precipitation static that some people claim would be really St. Elmo's fire, right? So if you've got a stack like three high or something like that, if the, and you're getting that precipitation static on reception, not on transmission, can I cut off the top one? And it's sort of acting as a shield, an umbrella. That's one little odds and ends. If you have three or more Yaggies, different current dis distributions rather than equal currents can become something worth looking into. Of course, a lot of this you end up with a lot of coax. I know of one antenna situation that I think has 1,300 feet of coax on the tower, okay? That's a lot of coax. Um, if you have multiples of 360 degrees, of course, you can remove them, right? 
if you have multiples of 180 degrees, you can cut those out too, but then like bip and bop usually changes sets. And although most of the people that I know of put the stacking box on the tower, usually between the antennas, depending upon how long the coax runs are on that, you could put the box down at the basement. A friend of mine, um, Jeff AC0C, has his stacking box, not in the basement, at the ba bottom of the tower, right? And now if there's maintenance concerns, you're right there, you're not having to climb the tower. Okay, what about multi-band Yagi stacking? Similar analysis, but more complex because of the compromises. If you go with half wavelength on 20, you have three quarters on 15 and one on 10. So, you know, you're trying to pick your poison there. Um, an interesting idea, if you wanted to have wider spacing is, well, put like 10 meter monoband antennas to fill the gaps, right? That's one thing you could do. Now, it is tough usually to get accurate models of multiband antennas. Um, so you might have to model it as monoband ones and sort of piece together the results. Now, here's an interesting thing. Justin Johnson, K0KSC, just presented this talk, standing in the same place as I am at Contest University, but the one in Milan. And after you guys listening to me now, I'm sure you wish you were in Milan. Um, in any case, in the CTU Milan recently, he had this paper, Enhanced Performance of Stacked Arrays. So notice what he has here. He has three Yaggies, and they're fed, right? The red circle is what modeling does in EasyNet to show you a source or a feed point. But what he's done is put nothing but parasitic elements in the stack, sort of filling in the gaps. And he's going to deliver that same presentation Friday at the Antenna Forum. So if you want to hear about that. OK, excellent. Um, so that's something here that, that's coming on the table. Well, the idea is that I'm assuming, and I didn't hear the presentation, although I ripped off the slides, that you could end up with, for, for the lower frequencies, you can take a larger spacing, but then you don't sacrifice the higher frequency bands where the gaps would be too big. So, you know, they're sort of giving you a re-radiated re source of energy in the gaps there. Which I think you could do if this was, you know, like just a 10 meter Yagi by itself, then you would have a five high 10 meter stack. Am I sort of saying it right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, and this, I think, is some fairly new stuff, and he'll begin doing it Friday here at the Antenna Forum. Okay, here's one last little example, stacking longer versus shorter booms. And, in fact, here's Tim again. You got mentioned here, Tim. See, I try to mention everybody in, you know, the group here. Um, but this was an example that happened at K8AZ. So Tom had two 42-foot boom um, Yaggies up here at um, whatever the heights were, and for a number of reasons, because let me tell you, this tower is chock full of Yaggies. There are like nine Yaggies on this rotating tower. The thought came up, well, what if we replace these two longer boom ones with four shorter, uh, shorter boom ones on a rotating tower? And of course, you could do the modeling, and you know, they're, they're somewhat similar. The four have a little bit more gain. There are a few more feet of boom and a few more elements, so let's be fair there. Maybe a little bit less overhead gain here. But um, to sort of get to the bottom line of it here, this was put up in the summer of 2013. And then in the 10 meter contest uh, in the fall there, the uh, station was operated by Ron K8NZ. Now, of course, Tom does have 10 different 10 meter Yaggies at a station. So here's four of them. So I don't want to take full credit for this. But nonetheless, hey, look at this. K8AZ, K8NZ operating, single operator CW only high power, you know, top leading score. Um, can you stack non-identical Yaggies? Yes. Um, what like the, the antenna book talks about is keeping them in phase alignment, right? So if you had a very long boom Yaggy and a shorter one, Ideally, vertically, you would see the driven elements line up, right? So in some sense, the phase is consistent from there. And that's a case where you might deliberately make the lines uneven length to accomplish that. Five more minutes? You were supposed to do that 10 minutes ago. I told everybody you were going to come in here and yell at me. That's right, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, you have the same rate of antenna, and you have the same length of beam line, or coil, uh, And so you did have different lengths. To, to even though the driven elements didn't line up right. vertically. We'll have to talk about that one. Hmm. Okay. Well, the good news is I'm at the end of my slide. Any questions, gang? Thank you for attending. Um, I don't know. That's a very good point. The, the question here, yeah, that's right. He does, boy, let me, not that I really need to get here, mind you. I may have already screwed this up. But that K6TU site, the question is, what part of the world does it look at? And I guess I don't know. Um, I was sort of being a fat, dumb, and lazy American there saying, it covers me. Um, but that's a very good question because, of course, as I said, in the old days, I don't know if anybody did HFTA data like 10 years ago. It was a pain, right? I mean, you would spend a whole evening struggling through that stuff. And now, trust me, you go, the sad thing is, and it's K6TU in the room, he makes you sign up and do all this other stuff and you feel like I'm getting slimy here. But then you click and he gives you, you know, 360 files at every degree of azimuth and you download it in a zip and it's like the happiest day of your life. So um, it is good stuff, and you know that's really the extent of it. And so it's a good site. I, I don't want to badmouth him. Um, anything else? Were you saying in there that all the antennas being run in phase pretty much all the time we is... three angles. We kind of got 180 systems. So we have top, bottom, in phase, and out of phase. So we have four choices. Mm -hmm. What we found was if you pick a single spacing, it turned out to be about 35 feet. Or we get angle cleanup. Mm -hmm. So we get a little takeoff angle. So the stuff that meets the front had a pretty good gain increase, two and a half to three dB for the higher bands towards zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, certainly if DX is your consideration, the low angles are always where it matters, right? Um, that's for sure. Anything else? Yeah, that's correct. You can make them out of phase. I think that was an option added, not in the first version, but later versions. But you can put selective Yaggies out of phase, but that's it. 
Yeah. Well, and of course, that's the thing about contesting, which is so interesting, is like me, I'm really a DXer, not a contester. I shouldn't say that in this room. But if I don't, you know, work the DX expedition on Wednesday, maybe I'll get them on Thursday. In the contesting environment, it really is. I want to work this now, right? Something that says this stack because you're missing a combination. Uh, a combination is, is that a 5% disadvantage is a big thing. I mean, do you want to throw out 5% of your contacts or something? Go ahead. Yeah, boy, that's, that's sort of above my pay grade. Um, pardon me? Yeah, you do have to model it and sort of try. The theme here has been just avoid the nulls, right? Just don't get caught with something that uh, by surprise. All right, we're done here, gang. Here's the boss. Thank you. Lunchtime slides? No, not yet. Okay, well, I've got to change that back. Change the stick. Oh, you Yeah, well, Dan has a different stick. That's right. Okay. I can never make up my money, so it's always different. What's this?